Okay, well, welcome everybody. <laughs> Hello. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Today we're going to be jumping into the affiliated business arrangement. Whoops, and the uh, buyer disclosures. And moving forward, uh, all these will be recorded, um, and I'll send out the recording. And I'm probably going to. Uh, discontinue our coaching at 6 p.m. on Wednesdays. So there'll be, we're, we're changing the schedule slightly and everyone will be updated, but within the next couple of weeks, we'll be doing two trainings a week during the afternoon. Those will be recorded and sent out. So anyone that can't attend those will have access to those, okay? Anyway, um, I'll keep everyone informed of that. And I'm just gonna pull up the Affiliated business arrangement first, and we'll start with that one. Okay. So basically, this is really just a form that's disclosing that um, there are other businesses associated with our office that we have in house, and that it says at the top there um, this is giving notice that Roseville Integrity Realty doing business as Keller Williams Integrity Realty have businesses, sorry, have business and ownership relationships with settlement service providers set forth below. Because of these relationships, referrals to these recommendations or recommendations of these entities may provide a financial or other benefit to the referring party. So it's just disclosing that these are available to these people, to people that you're working with, um, and that the owner of the brokerage may have interest in one or more of these businesses as well, right? For example, Todd is part owner of Minnesota Title, so certainly he gets some sort of compensation for his ownership portion in that company. Um, of course, your clients don't have to use any of these, but if they did, this is just a disclosure letting them know that there's an arrangement between the owner of the brokerage and the owner of the, um, or the owner of the office, I should say, and the owner of one of these companies. And then of course it does say right there, you are not required to use any of these providers as a condition for purchase, sale or refinance of the subject property. And that there's plenty of others available. And then page two, it just pretty much gives a breakdown of, of the settlement charges that potentially could, uh, the, the buyer could potentially incur, right? So owner's policies, most of, and, and these are the same charges as, and, as at any of these sorts of companies. Right. Um, and then it's just an acknowledgement down here by the client. And then of course your client signed there and date. So that was a quick one. Any, any questions on this or uh, about how to explain this to a client or potential client? All right, last chance or it's closing. Okay. Then let's move right on to the buyer disclosures. Now these disclosures have nothing to do with, these are only disclosures for our office, right? These are disclosures that our office has created to explain to buyers and sellers. So they're clear on many of these items. And I'm gonna read through this verbatim uh, cause it's only a couple, two pages long and we'll discuss each of these topics that are mentioned here. So we'll start with the broker acknowledgement. And the buyer is saying that they acknowledge that the agent is acting under the brokerage of Keller Williams Integrity Realty in Roseville, and that each KW office is independently owned and operated. Dual agency will only be created by representation of clients through this office. So that's another important one. There are brokerages such as uh, Cobalt Banker. Um, as far as large brokerages, that's the first one that comes to mind. They are it wouldn't matter if you're doing business with someone in that office, if you were in a Cola Biker office or some office across town or up north or something like that, that's all one brokerage, okay? Keller Williams uh, is franchised and each one of those Keller Williams offices is independently owned and operated. So dual agency is only created if you are both representing the buyer and the seller. So it's your listing and then you represent a buyer that buys it. Um, or if it's your listing and someone else only in our office brings in the buyer, 
or vice versa. Someone in our office has a listing and you're bringing the buyer. That would be dual agency. So if you're, if you're representing both or if you're representing one and an agent only from our office is representing the other. Any questions on dual agency? Because that does get confusing. I get questions of that often. So, okay. So buyer further acknowledges that Keller Williams Integrity Realty is a licensed real estate broker engaged in the practice of real estate and real estate market, real estate sales and marketing. KW Integrity Realty is not an expert in any other field, including without limitation. And then it lists a whole number of things that we're not experts in. If you have a need for these professional services, you should find the appropriate professional by acknowledges they have the opportunity to consult with an attorney. Okay, this is a disclosure about, about the home inspection. Buyer acknowledges that the agent has informed the buyer of the right to have a home inspection. Buyer further acknowledges that broker and broker's agents do not warrant the condition of the property or any personal property. And usually you're gonna be signing this these, this document, um, the same time as you're getting the other rep documents signed. And you'll always wanna include this one. This again is just a, I'm not gonna read through this, but this is just a uh, disclosure talking about the importance of a home inspection and why your client should have one, okay? And then they're signing this. So this is the disclosure. This is, this is what's clearly saying that we've discussed um, inspections and the right to have an inspection with them by them signing this, okay? Okay, any questions on that? Inspections or those types of things. All right, then let's move on to number three. Buyer's home warranty plan, purchase, acceptance, or waiver. Uh, buyer acknowledges that the agent has informed the informed buyer of the availability and cost of a home warranty plan for the property and that the plan is intended to cover major systems, including but not limited to heating, plumbing, electrical, AC and appliances. Buyer acknowledges that the home warranty plan will be subject to a deductible and buyer shall indicate below whether they accept or decline a home warranty plan. Now, this is a, this section to me is a little bit odd because of the, either the agree or decline, right? Like acknowledging that you explain what a home warranty plan is, is one thing, but I'm not sure why we have to decline or agree um, I always check the decline box because they're obviously not going to be purchasing one at the moment. Um, and so, and maybe they will, maybe they won't, right? But be, if they check decline here, it doesn't mean that now they cannot buy a home warranty, okay? Um, it's just that they're not gonna, it, it may not even be them purchasing it. It's possible to ask the seller to pay for it. So anyway, you want to, the point of this is to make sure that you've told them that there is such a thing as a home, a home warranty. Um, it covers the major systems typically as kind of across the board standard. Most all companies cover um, heating, plumbing, electrical, AC, and appliances. Uh, and then there's extra coverage. Some of them don't cover the, uh, you know, refrigerator or some might not cover an extra freezer or things like that. So, um, but the main point is just that the client understands that home warranties are available and they can purchase one if they would like. I mean, you could purchase a home warranty. I could, I know I lived here for six years. I could purchase one for my house right now if I wanted, right? So they can be purchased anytime. Matt, how, yeah. how much do they run generally? Oh, thanks for asking that. Um, I'd say typically they're going to be between 450 on the low end for a real basic coverage. Um, and then you could spend up to say 700 or, or maybe even a little bit higher, but for a mid grade average one, it's probably gonna be around 550 and 450 on the lowest end. And most of those cover for a year. Some of them, I think HWA covers for 13 months. Uh, many of those also, if the, if you're, as far as the listings concerned, um, you could, your seller could purchase one to avoid having to, you know, if they know their appliances are old and their furnace might be kind of towards the end of its lifespan, they could purchase a home warranty and many of those will cover the listing as well. So let's say you take a listing, they bought a home warranty for the buyer, but it covers the listing through the listing period. So 
before you close, let's say the furnace went out, many of these companies will cover that cost for the seller. And then that will transfer to the buyer once they close. So a seller could use that to avoid, you could also use that in negotiating you know, for a listing. If, you're, if your seller doesn't want to buy a new furnace, they can say, no, we're not gonna do that, but we will buy you a home warranty that covers it since it's currently in working condition, right? Um, any other questions on home warranties? Okay, let's move on. Hey, Matt, oh, sorry, yeah. do you find that people often purchase them later on? Like, is it something that, you know- Like after they close kind of thing? Or just in general, I mean, it, I don't know. Is it like a common thing that people- Not typically... super common in this okay. market. Um, okay. I'd say it's less common in this kind of a market because well, buyers are scrambling to get anything they can. And so sellers have all the power. So usually a buyer can use that in negotiating and you could still do that. Like, let's say you go through an inspection, you want a multiple offers, but you don't want to rock the boat and ask for a bunch of stuff. Instead of asking for some major things to be paid for by the seller, you could just ask them to provide a home warranty, right? Would um, you have to disclose that in the original PA or could you? Add that no, like, it. like, like it'd be an example like this. Like, let's say you wrote a PA for a client and, uh, you, you got it and you did, and the client wants to do an inspection. Okay. And then you do say a five day inspection, but you find that the furnace is that it's, it's nearing the end of its lifespan, right? It still works, but it's not efficient and it's kind of clunking out and your clients are really concerned about it. Uh, cause they don't want to get into November and then their furnace burns out. So you can you could then say well look in this market asking for a new furnace might not be likely to go through the seller had seven other offers they could simply just say no we're not doing that and move on to somebody else so we could instead of that ask them to provide a home warranty which will at least cover it for a year that way you know you're going to be good throughout this winter and next spring and so on right so you could use it in negotiating both with your client as the buyer but also to the seller instead of asking for a you know, a $4,000 furnace, you're asking for a $500 home warranty. Make sense? Mm -hmm. But no, I would say it's not super common right now. Okay. So then would you have to, because I know typically we've been including like buyers will not ask for any compensation or repairs. So would you not be allowed to include that verbiage then if you did decide to include them or ask for a home warranty later? Yeah, I think if you're, I think if you, if you put that verbiage in, um, then you, you would either ask for that, like you would either just accept it as it is, or you would just let them, let the listing agent know that you're going to cancel. Okay. Yeah. But again, even in that situation, you could call the listing agent and say, you know, the inspection went okay, but there were a number of things that, um, my clients just aren't willing to accept. So we're going to honor the language in the contract and, and we'll be sending over a cancellation, right? You might find then the agent says, well, wait a minute, what are the things that, what are the issues, right? And then you could explain the issues and the agent could then possibly say, well, let me just talk to the seller before we cancel anything and just see what they think, right? Um, and then it could be a situation where you could, they come back and say, well, we're willing to do some things, right? Then maybe you could say, you know, what we're really looking for then is a home warranty because we want to make sure the furnace is covered or whatever. But if you're going to, if you're going to put that verbiage in, then you shouldn't ask for anything, right? And you shouldn't ask for a, a, a reduction in price or anything like that. You should honor the language and tell them, you know, unfortunately we're going to cancel. It just may be the case that you may find that because this has happened to a number of agents I coach with where they found some things they didn't like and they decided to cancel and they still got it all put together because the seller decided, well, you know, we'll take care of those things. We're not that worried about it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so anyway, does that help? Yes. Okay, Thank good. You. Good. Okay. The final walkthrough then. KW Integrity recommends that buyers accompany their agents, um, accompanied by their agents, walk through the property prior to closing to make sure that all, if any, required repairs and corrections have been completed. So that's checking on inspection items that you asked for the seller to repair. 
Um, we recommend that buyers check to see that all electrical, plumbing, heating, and cooling systems are in proper working order to the satisfaction of the buyer and the property is substantially in the same condition as of the date that the purchase agreement was signed. Except as otherwise provided by agreement or statute, there are no warranties regarding the condition of the property after closing. The buyer chooses to waive the right to inspect the property. Buyer will hold uh, KW Integrity Realty harmless for the condition of the property. KW Integrity Realty and its agents make no representations and are not responsible for any conditions existing in the property. So basically the final walkthrough is to check to make sure that everything is still working. There's no, like all of a sudden there's a huge hole in the wall or something like that. There's not a bunch of trash or personal property left behind by the seller. Um, and that it's generally in the same condition as when you wrote the purchase agreement, right? So ultimately when you do the final walkthrough, you'd wanna do it either the night before the closing or the morning before, but it would be ideal to have all of the seller's blinds out there's going to be times where that's not the case. There's been times where I've shown up and there's almost nothing moved. And then we have a problem, right? Because then obviously they're not going to be able to get out by, you know, 10 a.m. the next day. So, um, and these things happen. They, they happen. So when I'd be scheduling it, I would be scheduling for as close to the closing as I could get. Um, that being said, if, if, if repairs are being done and these repairs have to be signed off on and maybe need to be double checked, you might want to do two final walkthroughs. Do one like three to five days prior just to check that the work that you asked for the seller to do has been complete. Um, because that way, if it's not, you can make some adjustments or you have some time to deal with that before the closing. And then you'd want to do it again after the sellers have moved all their belongings out just prior to the closing. I have a question, man. Sure. Uh, oh. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, it was muted again for a minute, but go ahead. Yes. Uh, today is the day of final walkthrough day for my listing. So okay. I am wondering if the uh, buyer figures out some problem on the electrical, for example, and uh, if they uh, let us know that the electrical has uh, not working really well, even in the inspection, everything was working well right now, maybe if there is a problem. So yeah. who's going to be responsible to repair this problem? What are we going to do at the end of the day? Well, what do you, let's, what do you think you should do? Let's start with that. Like, let's yeah. say it's there at the final walkthrough and they're like, well, something's wrong and the furnace isn't working or the electrical, whatever, say there's some issue. They're gonna call you first. Yes. So currently the seller owns the property, right? Mm -hmm. So who would be responsible for the property at that moment? Seller probably. Right, right. So. What you would have to do like in anything in real estate is negotiate so there's no automatic if this is a problem this person fixes it it's going to be assumed by the buyer that the seller is going to fix it and that's would be normal because it's a material change from from when they last saw the property right but it would have to be some sort of negotiation because if it's closing that day and you're not going to have time to get an electrician in there and all those things you'll have to work that out with the the other party right mm -hmm. and either okay well we will have to delay closing then to get these items fixed or the seller will pay for them and we'll continue with the closing you can put it in, into an escrow account i mean you just have to negotiate you have to first find out what does everybody want to do obviously no one wants to pay for it no one wanted that problem to begin with but it's mm -hmm. going to be assumed sort of that the seller would right Yes. Um, and then you have to talk to the seller and then go back to the buyer and talk to the, you know, just, just like negotiating any other part of the contract. Okay. Still risk is still the risk is going on. <laughs> yeah. Cause we have a saying that it's, it's not closed till it's closed. Yes. I've had like the, the night before the closing, there was an electrical storm and, and a, and a bolt of lightning hit. And if you're familiar with an invisible fence, it's like this wire that's underground to protect the dogs. dogs. Yeah. yeah. It hit that. It traveled up the invisible fence into the garage, blew out the panel, and started a fire. Right? Oh, really? So oh. I got a, I got a call that, oh, we had a fire here now. We're supposed to close the next day. Oh, my so gosh. You can imagine. 
Mm-hmm. I was, that was a crazy morning getting all that worked out, but we got it worked out and closed, but it was that close to all falling apart. Right. So, yes. so these things happen, these, there, there's things that are going to happen that you can't even imagine. Right. It's just oh, yeah. part of, I mean, just like, just like life, things happen in life all the time that just slap you across the head. Like, Oh my gosh. And it's the same in this business. There's going to be things that come up and you're going to be like, I can't believe this is happening right now. Um, so you get good at negotiating and, and solving problems and those kind of things, right? Okay. The seller can still refuse to pay anything, right? He's right to say well, that. Well, he could, but then the buyer will could simply say, well, we're not going to close and that's fine. We'll take our earnest money back and good luck. And then, yeah. and then the seller will fix it anyway and resell it. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Thanks. Mm-hmm. A lot. Most of what we have to do in this in this business is is give people perspective, right? Because clients will get money's involved. Money is the most emotional topic, really, that there is. Um, everyone has different thoughts and feelings around money, so it causes all these problems, and there's a ton of emotion. So people can get very fixated on a small thing, and lose perspective about the entire the whole picture right so we have to we have to bring them back remind them of their goal right if they get really bogged down i'm not going to close remember why we started this whole process you wanted this new property you wanted to live in this city you wanted your kids to go to this school so let's just get through this let's just do the right thing get this taken care of close and move on with life right yes okay great thank you you're welcome Okay, moving on to, oh, and then of course, I'm always checking that we will have a final walkthrough. I don't know why you wouldn't do a final walkthrough. Um, okay, multiple offers. Again, this is just disclosing multiple offers. Uh, multiple offer occurs when one or more buyer or agent representing a buyer submits an offer to purchase a seller's property. A buyer's awareness that there is an existing or pending offer may cause the buyer to among other things, submit a higher offer or to not submit or withdraw a pending offer. A seller's agent is not automatically required to disclose the existence of multiple offers to a buyer or an agent repping the buyer. Rather, a seller's agent will disclose the existence of other offers to buyer or agent repping buyer in response to an inquiry only if the seller approves the disclosure. And that is is totally true Although I don't see any benefit to not disclosing that there's multiple offers, right? Because all that can mean is it's more likely that your client, your, your seller will get more money. Um, Buyer understands that in short sales and bank owned transactions, multiple offers are commonplace. Buyer acknowledges that buyer's agent may ask seller agent if the other offers have been submitted on the seller's property. Buyer understand that the seller's agent <clears throat> may be directed by seller to disclose or not disclose the existence of other offers on a seller's property. Buyer acknowledges that the information on the existence of multiple offers may affect the terms of any other offer that buyer may choose to submit. So multiple offers are very common. This is for sure something you want to have a conversation with a new buyer client um, as you set the expectation for the current market conditions, right? It's likely that if we find a home you like, there's going to be 10 or 20 others that do as well. And it's likely we're going to be in a multiple offer situation. And if we're in a multiple offer situation, experience shows that if you don't go above list price in that situation, you're, you're not going to get the property. That's what I tell. That's what, exactly what I would be telling buyers in this current market. Hey, Matt. Yeah. Here's the question. Um, what about buyers that have hesitancy right now and say, well, I'm just going to wait till the market settles down. Like, aren't these sales right now, closings, Mm going to affect appraisals in two months? So all those properties that are like kind are going to be at a similar price point anyway, or does that not happen? Yeah, no, that is true. If, if they're going to, if they want to wait until the market shifts, um, it, it really, that, that's a question of what's their motivation, right? Do they have to move um, or do they just want to move and it's not that big of a deal with for them if they do or don't, right? So that's how we're going to be able to give them the best advice. 
if they have to move, then they have to move and they're just going to have to deal with the situation. If they want to wait and try and play the market, they could have to wait for, it could be six months. It could be two years. It could be five years, right? We just don't know. And we don't know what, what for them is a reasonable price. Like if someone just says, oh, houses are too expensive now, right? What, what does that mean to you? What, what are you basing that it's too expensive on, right? Where's the data that you're basing your thought process on? Um, so we can get a clear understanding of what they're thinking and then explain and give them perspective on what the reality is. Does that help? But I mean, ultimately, I think you're right. It's, I mean, the prices are going to continue. It's not like once we get to fall, prices are going to drop 20%, right? Right, and I think that's, I have a couple buyers that are, seem to have that mindset that, and I don't know how to dissuade it's, them. It's common. Um, what I normally tell people is, look, all predictions, if you, if you pay attention to what the industry is saying, is that this will continue certainly through this year. I think it's going to start to shift this fall. I just mean, I think we're going to start seeing more inventory. Maybe days on market will um, become a little bit longer. Maybe we'll start seeing some price reductions and slowly we'll shift into more of a buyer market. But it shouldn't be anything like it was uh, during the crash because of many, many factors. Um, the biggest one being is people have way more equity right now than they did back then. Um, but it won't be like, you know, a $300,000 house is all of a sudden now it's, now it's 250, right? That kind of a drop is, is very unlikely. So I would just be explaining to them that, that the trends, the data shows the trends are gonna continue the same and in fact, most of what I'm reading says expectations are another 10% gain this year. So it, it's, it's kind of a, it's a tough call. Um, but there's always going to be those people in that, in that mindset that are going to wait until the market shifts, right? So it, again, it always really goes back to their motivation and the client's time frame. If they don't have, if their motivation is low, they don't need to move. Um, then maybe it's best for them to wait, right? Because they're not going to be happy in this kind of a market and you'll write 50, 30 offers for them and none of them win because they're not willing to go up to the price point that's necessary. So it could be your advice that yes, I think it is smart to wait because otherwise you're going to waste your time and they're going to waste their time in a market that they're not just, they don't have the, um, the mindset to purchase it, right? It's it's also the same giving perspective to someone who wants to buy, like, let's say they, they well, I, I don't want to spend more than 250, but I want a five bedroom, four bath in Edina off Fran France and 50th, right? Well, that's an unrealistic expectation. So what I would have to say is that home, that home could exist at some time, but it doesn't exist right now in this market. Um, so it's it's probably not right for you to buy in this market. So anyway, I hope that helps. It does, thanks. You're welcome. I have one more question, Matt. Sure. Yeah, are we allowed to uh, tell uh, the highest offer price to the uh, agent who is gonna give any offer? Are yeah, ethically you can, you can disclose like you could tell someone, like if you have multiple offers, you could tell one of them, you could tell someone, if you guys come up five grand, the next highest one is this, you guys could, okay. you guys could get it. You can do that. It's not common, um, but I think it's in article 17 of the code of ethics. It does state in one of those sections that, and it seems weird. It seems like, it seems like you shouldn't be able to do it, right? Because it feels kind of, I don't know. It feels strange to do that. Um, I've never done it. I just, I just don't, I just say, I can't tell you that. I can tell you you're close or you're not quite there. It's just how I played it. As long as you have clients permission though, um, you can tell them that that's correct. Okay. Cause once the buyer agent, sorry, the, yeah, the sale, I uh, called a seller agent and then I asked this question, did you receive any offer? Mm -hmm. And I asked what was the highest price? And he told me that this is a confidential, so I can't tell you what was the highest price he told me. Like yeah. That. 
And that's probably gonna be the most common response. It's not common to tell people what that price point is. And if the client, um, I'd say most agents don't realize that you even can do that. Like, I think this guy probably just thought, well, no, I can't tell you that. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I think just naturally we feel like that's privileged information. Like it's unfair to the other offers if we do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but our job is to get the most money for our client, which is the seller. So I believe that's why it's ethically allowed to be able to do that. Yeah. If it's going to equal more money um, in a quicker time frame with less hassle, then we can, then that's, that's the job for us as agents for a seller. Yes. In a politely way. Yes. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So the last section in here, the two last sections are the residential disclosure and the broker commission. So sellers of a residential property are with limited ex exceptions obligated to satisfy the seller disclosure requirements of MN statute 513. In many bank owned transactions, the bank has never seen the foreclosed property and may not have personal knowledge of the condition of the property and will therefore refuse to sign any disclosures and may or may not sign a waiver to meet the disclosure requirements. <clears throat> My knowledge is that some short sale bank owned properties are sold as is, and many have not many and may not have the required disclosures and agrees to hold Keller Williams integrity harmless for the condition of the property, so on and so forth. Uh, KW integrity encourages buyers of as is properties to perform an inspection to ensure the property condition is to the satisfaction of the buyer. Closing on a transaction shall serve as proof of the condition of the property is to the satisfaction of the buyer. Um, and then just real quick on as is. So if, if, if a seller is requiring an as is, you can still do an inspection. The only, the only, all that really means is there's not gonna be much for disclosure, if any, and the seller's very unlikely to do any sort of work, but you can certainly still do an inspection. You can cancel based on inspection and those kind of things. Um, and then of course the broker commission, now, the client acknowledges that a 399 broker commission will be charged at the successful close of their transaction. And what I, what I say to clients about the broker commission is that's a commission or a fee, or we're not supposed to call it a fee, that every brokerage charges every buyer and seller. So it doesn't matter if you're at EXP or Remax or Coal Banker or Keller Williams, all those brokers charge every buyer and every seller this fee. The fee typically ranges from from low end of 400, which is where we're at, up to six or 750. I think I've seen it as high as 750 before. Uh, and though th that, th that fee goes towards uh, paying for document storage and office infrastructure. So it goes to help pay for running an office essentially. And then I just move on. Okay, any questions on any of those items that we covered today or these two documents? Okay, then thank you all for being here and investing time in yourselves and your business. And I will see you all very soon. Thank, thank you. you, man. Thanks, Take care. Matt. Take care, everybody.